thank you. If everybody could just sit. All right, well, ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, we have arrived at the last session of the last day of a day and a half event on island perspectives from the Indian Ocean and the Pacific. But if you were flagging, I'm here to tell you that Kurt Campbell can liven up any conversation. So I know this is gonna be an exciting uh, session. I'm, uh, I'm Evan Feigenbaum, I'm Vice President for Studies at Carnegie. Kurt, of course, is uh, Deputy Assistant to the President and the Coordinator of all things Indo-Pacific inside the US government. Kurt, you're a popular act, so we have a lot of people joining us just for this session. So if you don't mind, if you indulge me, I'm just gonna take 10 seconds and tell people that this is an annual islands dialogue we do as part of an Indian Ocean Initiative that is a partnership between the Carnegie Endowment and the Sasakawa Peace Foundation in Tokyo. There are two things that are unique about this dialogue. One, it includes islands from both the Pacific and the Indian Ocean islands that are unique in their way, but share some of the same perspectives, priorities, and challenges. And then second, as I said on the first day, there's a tendency in talking about these regions to talk about the geopolitics. And what we try to do in this dialogue is flip the script to put the islands and the island stories really at the center of the conversation. Now, when I pick up a newspaper and I read about these parts of the world, people talk about the United States sometimes as if the US woke up sometime between last Tuesday and last Saturday and discovered these regions, particularly the Pacific. And I'm here to tell you that is not true. And our guest for this panel exemplifies that in his career. I'm old enough to remember when Kurt Campbell persuaded then Secretary of State Hillary Clinton to go to the Cook Islands in 2012 for a Pacific Forum. He's been focused on this through several administrations. And that makes sense because the United States is a maritime power. So anywhere there's ocean, uh, the United States is active and involved. The United States, particularly in the Pacific, is a resident power with American Samoa uh, and with uh, Guam and other territories. And then third, the United States, as some of you know, has these very unique compacts of free association with three countries in the Pacific. Um, so the US is resident, the US is concerned, the US has been involved for a long time. And Kurt, I thought maybe that would be a good place to start because I'm kind of old fashioned. I like to start with American interests. So I was hoping you might kick us off by talking a little bit about American interests as you see them uh, in both regions, but particularly in the Pacific. And since you've watched this for a long time, how you think they've evolved, what's constant and what's evolved as a result either of more recent geopolitics or challenges for the island countries, but how should we think about American priorities and interests in these two regions? First of all, Evan, let me just take a moment to say thank you uh, to you and your team. I think this is an extraordinarily important topic. Sometimes it gets overlooked. I'm grateful for Carnegie that you've conducted these dialogues over a substantial period of time, and they do bring to light the substantial, enduring, and in many, many respects shared uh, interests and issues that are confronting island nations, uh, both in the Indian Ocean and the Pacific. Um, <clears throat> as you rightly say, it's an issue that I've cared about deeply. Uh, my father served in the Pacific during the Second World War when I was in the Navy. I had a chance to serve there myself and I've worked on it uh, as an issue basically of abiding interests for a long period of time. So when you talk about interests, um, I would suggest to you that I think the United States has uh, a number of critical interests and those interests are strategic, they are moral, uh, uh, they are political, uh, and they are humanitarian. Um, and I would simply just underscore where you began. Um, there are incredibly important sea lines of communication. The Pacific is the gateway to basically modern industry, inventiveness, uh, exchange of goods. Uh, the stability in the region matters enormously. The Pacific is also ground zero in many respects for the implications of climate change. Some of the most important issues associated with with uh, global food stocks, with uh, uh, you know fishing uh, ventures, uh, uh, are key in the Pacific. There are a whole host of issues that we are watching carefully, and frankly, in many respects, that we are concerned by. So I would say that the United States, uh, even before the Second World War, many times we 
basically, you know, uh, mark uh, Evan the beginning of our interest there with the arrival of Marines in Guadalcanal. As you know, our interests there proceed. We had substantial interest in many of the islands uh, uh, in the 1800s. And uh, we've maintained uh, a variety of political and strategic interactions um, with islands, both in Micronesia and Melanesia and Polynesia. And so I think what we've tried to do, what President Biden has tried to do, uh, building on previous uh, administrations, is frankly, Evan, to step up our game across so many areas. This is a region that wants to have better relations with the United States. It's a region First of all, as, as you point out, and you know better than I, frankly, it's it's not uh, it, it's you know, it's a very diverse region there. There are so many differences between the island nations and and the appreciation that the United States has played this historical role is something that that I think we have to remind ourselves and others. But I would say that what you're seeing is that we're trying to engage across many parameters on climate change, on legal fishing, on uh, the legacies of war, unexploded ordinance, more in terms of, of aid and assistance, uh, issues associated with uh, building lines of communication, technology, jobs, education, educational uh, opportunities, everything that basically that we deal with in development in places like Africa uh, and elsewhere. The challenges are enormous, Evan, uh, but the United States can do much more, not just alone, but in partnership with other countries. That's great. Can you can you talk a little bit, Kurt, about what's changed, let's say, over the last 20 to 25 years? You know, you served in the Clinton administration. You worked on uh, island nations in that context. I was in the Bush administration, the first term of Bush 43. Uh, I remember there was renegotiation of the compacts. So that was roughly 2002, 2003. So there was that set of changes. Then you were in the Obama administration. I mentioned the the Secretary Clinton's trip to the to the Pacific, and now you're doing this step up under Biden. So what's what what's new over that 25 year period, either in terms of the way the United States engages or the issue set that that you're hearing about from these governments? So first of all, I, I think what's most important at the outset is that the circumstances in many of these Pacific island nations. Uh, are much more dire than they were in the past. Their livelihoods are threatened. Climate change is existential. Uh, they face uh, enormous challenges of governance. Um, COVID uh, 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 harmed uh, most of these uh, uh, nations substantially, both with the cutoff of visitors and tourists and uh, even uh, narrow uh, business interests were badly hurt. So I would begin with that, that the need is great. Um, there is an undeniable strategic component, Evan, you've referred to this. I think we've seen in the last several years a more ambitious China that seeks to develop uh, a uh, footprint militarily and the like uh, in the Indo-Pacific. I, I think that has caused some anxiety with partners uh, like Australia, New Zealand, even countries in the region as a whole. Um, I think that's an added dimension uh, to uh, the circumstances. I think there's also a uh, deeper recognition that in the past, we have perhaps paid lesser attention to these critical places than, than we should have. And I think being honest about that is important. Um, you know, when I first started traveling to the Pacific, we had robust uh, AID programs. We had, uh, you know, very uh, strong ongoing uh, Peace Corps uh, uh, programs across much of the Pacific. Uh, we did more in terms of Coast Guard deployments and the like. Some of those, frankly, over time atrophied, and now we're in the process of rebuilding all of those and more. Um, I would also say that you see nascent uh, institution building in the form of the Pacific Island Forum, something that we support uh, very much. And I think it is also the case that there are other countries that are deeply involved in the Pacific, like-minded states, 
One of the things that we've tried to do, Evan, and I, you'll probably get to this with the launch of what we call the Partners of the Blue Pacific. The Blue Pacific is the blueprint of the Pacific Island nations, what they see with respect to what they want to do in their own future. Um, we have tried to uh, put together an unofficial grouping of like-minded nations, the United States, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, uh, uh, Great Britain, a few others will join. Secretary Blinken will have an important event uh, uh, on this issue uh, and this initiative on Thursday at the United Nations. But the idea being, what are the best practices for dealing with certain problems? How can we combine uh, our uh, joint efforts? In, in fact, much of the aid and assistance in the Pacific is not as well coordinated as, as it could be. We have not learned as much about best practices we're going to seek to do that as we go forward, building on the existing institutions uh, and engagements of the Pacific. Can I ask you, how much is the Indian Ocean factor into your thinking? You know, we, one of the things that's unique about this dialogue, we call it an Indo-Pacific dialogue, but in the island context, we literally mean Indian Ocean Islands, Pacific Islands. Somebody yesterday on one of the panels said that the United States had not put out a specifically Indian Ocean strategy since something like 1971 or 1972. So that could be because the United States doesn't prioritize it, but it could also be because the United States has a more integrated concept now through this notion of Indo-Pacific. And I'm since some of the challenges, there's parallelism between the challenges yes. some of the countries are facing, how integrated is your conception in terms of islands of Indo and Pacific? You, you know, um, it's a very good question, Evan. And in many respects, what happens in government is that there are certain lines of demarcation. And so, you know, sometimes one group of people that works on the Indian Ocean, I, I see the smile on your face because you recognize this problem, is different from the group of people that work on the Pacific Islands. But I would say that essentially some of the challenges are identical. The challenges of climate change, uh, a degree of strategic competition, big powers showing greater interests. And I think you're beginning to see uh, a greater degree of coordination among various countries also about the Indian Ocean arena as well. I will also just uh, uh, point to you, we have also seen this lack of a strategic approach to the Indian Ocean. I think we're going to try to remedy that going forward. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, could you could you look ahead to the you know the the summit uh, that uh, the president's going to do with Pacific Island leaders has come yeah. up a few times um, the last few days. One of the things we've heard, we've had a few foreign ministers. I did a dialogue with the prime minister of Tonga this morning. Um, there was a lot of talk about listening to island voices, and um, I know you're sensitive to that. I saw Wendy Sherman, the deputy secretary of state, was out in Hawaii doing a meeting, and she talked a lot, actually, uh, at least in the public statements, about things that are very much on their agenda. I saw references to climate, to employment, to upskilling, to innovation. So um, could you, I, I, I know you don't want to do the big reveal because you're going to leave that to the president, but I, I'm just wondering if you could give us a preview of what to expect yeah, and how I, you're I, thinking about the summit. I'd be happy to, Evan, and I, I do believe that a critical part of the potential success of this event will be uh, listening and addressing the very clearly stated needs and interests of Pacific Island nations. So I would just say just a couple of things. We have had um, island summits before, as you know, uh, in the Bush administration, we did uh, in the Obama administration. We've never had Pacific Island leaders um, to the White House. Um, and so I'll just give you a sense. This is a two day event. So it is not just one or two meetings. This is a very sustained effort that will involve almost all the key players in the US government um, who have interests in the Indo-Pacific. We will have a session at the Chamber of Commerce that will be about addressing business engagement in the Pacific that is carefully designed, not just for willy nilly, but specific industries that have interests in the Pacific, whether it's resources or tourism or eco farming. So we're excited about that. We will be meeting at, at a variety of places around Washington, the headquarters of the of the uh, of the Coast Guard that will be announcing new initiatives. I think you are well aware. I heard a great you, you, you had focused a little bit about ship rider agreements and other things that we've been able to employ. 
um, to deal with issues like illegal fishing. Uh, there will be substantial events at the State Department. Secretary Kerry will host on climate. Uh, we'll engage senior officials from USCID, from the Pentagon, from the Department of Interior, Homeland Security, and then it will culminate in what we hope will be an intimate and wonderful sustained dinner uh, that the president will host, uh, first of its kind, in the White House. And I think the goal here will not be just to listen, but also put on the table substantial resources and commitments, and not just in one or two areas, Evan, but in dozens of areas. Um, and so uh, you're right, I can't go into all the details, but my hope will be, this is a region that has been disappointed before. Sometimes expectations get raised, they are unfulfilled. Uh, we understand that the bar is high, and I think what we're gonna try to do is, um, is to fulfill those expectations. And I just, if I could just close with this thing, I think what is different than what I've experienced in the past, Evan, like you know what it's like in government, sometimes it's hard to get people motivated to make sure that other people share a sense of, you know, what's critical. I see none of that now. I see a substantial group of people from the president on down that recognizes our uh, uh, historical interests and our current interests. I, you know, refer you to the wonderful visit of Ambassador Kennedy and Deputy Secretary Sherman to Guadalcanal, in which they both talked about the experiences of their fathers there, and my father was there as well. So overall, um, I think it's an ambitious uh, effort and it's a desire to demonstrate clearly our larger commitment uh, to the Pacific going forward. Yeah, I think based on what we've heard the last day and a half, that's going to be music to the ears of a lot of people coming from the region. Yeah. Um, but it but it does get, I mean, that, that second point you made about putting things on the table, not just listening, but listening in a way that then leads to American ideas, resources, commitments. Um, that, that gets at the fact, it's something you alluded to where we talk about, I mean, I'm not naive about the geopolitics either. There are other players in the region. You mentioned Guadalcanal, so that brings us a little bit to the Solomons. Somebody, um, we, we were joking on one panel this morning that if you use a mathematical metaphor, for a lot of these countries, the operations that matter are addition and multiplication rather than subtraction and division. So to them, um, you know, China's a fact of life. China puts things on the table. Yes, there are the security questions, but how, how much how much is this a how does strategic competition i mean let's just put it on the table how much does strategic competition factor into the i mean obviously not just the way the united states is thinking about it but the kind of dialogue that the united states is now having with island countries and partner countries more broadly well, look evan there is an undeniable strategic component here i, I don't think it would be credible to deny this but at the same time, I think there's a recognition that the only way for the United States to be effective is to meet Pacific Islanders where they live. Like the way to show that you're relevant and that you care is if you have real programs on the table with respect to climate change and resilience and illegal fishing and unexplored ordinance. You just go down the list all the things that the Pacific Islanders have made quite clear to us for a substantial period of time. I, look, I, and I, I think part of what is concerning is that what we have seen, and Evan, you, you probably know and have written about this more than anyone, is more recently a uh, what appears to be the Chinese export of certain both technologies and approaches that are basically designed to replicate certain elements of authoritarian leadership, right? And, and those capabilities tend to be more interesting and appealing and worrying in environments where governments are weaker, institutions are more challenged. And so even though the Pacific does have some strong governments and uh, countries that are stable. There are also very clear challenges here where corruption uh, uh, is prevalent and certain practices can have uh, detrimental effects. And I think the desire of all the partners that I laid out, you know, Japan and 
uh, New Zealand, Australia, the United States, Great Britain, and others, Germany, France, is to underscore our commitment to more effective governance, to transparency, and the like. And I think um, the hope here is that the region does not descend into a kind of zero-sum competition, but rather embraces uh, a deep engagement from the partners that I laid out here around things that we think uh, all these nations care about and are critical for their longer term survival and success. Well, that makes sense to be. I mean, I'll just be blunt about it. I mean, the Solomons has come up a few times in conversation because yeah. I think for some people it's it's a kind of test case of that theory that the United States wants to focus on the interests of the countries, but China is very much in the background in that place and in some others. And since you've been front and center on that issue, you went down there at one point with a delegation. I'm just wondering if there's anything you want to tell us about the kind of traction you may or may not be getting in that case or what that case tells us about the kind of traction you may get elsewhere. Look, we're going to continue to engage deeply uh, in the region and in the Solomons. We're looking forward to consultations that we'll have uh, when uh, uh, Prime Minister Sogovar and others uh, from his delegation visit. Um, we've been very clear about what our interests are. We are going to step up our game with respect to um, uh, supporting a variety of initiatives uh, across the Pacific that will positively affect uh, the Solomons as well. But we've also been clear about what our concerns are, and we would not want to see, you know, a uh, capacity for long range power projection. And we've been very direct and clear uh, with all concerned here. Great. I want to, uh, I know, I know uh, there are some constraints in your time. So I want to, I'm, we'll keep talking, but I want to cue the audience that if you have questions, make it known to me so that I know where you are. Okay. I'll start to come to you. I just want to ask you one more question, which is about sure. partnerships. Um, you know, Australia has a new government. I, I, I've lost count of how many times Penny Wong has been in the Pacific now, but it, it feels like every other week she's visiting. She's been in Tonga. She's been here. She's been there. Can you can you just talk about how you're thinking about uh, external partners? You mentioned you mentioned this in passing a little bit earlier, but I'm wondering if uh, how much of what you're trying to do is either to develop complementary approaches with others as opposed to joint ones. Are there places you want to fold behind other external partners, particularly on the financing side? Are there things that partners can do that the United States is content to have them front and center? Just how's that, how's that evolving for you with Australia and with others? Yeah, Evan, you've laid it out perfectly. I'm, you should be doing this. So you know, our <laughs> efforts are both complementary, in some cases joint. I, I think we recognize that that the leading nations in the Pacific uh, have, and they are of the Pacific, uh, Australia and New Zealand, in many respects, we are seeking to support them, work closely with them. Um, they have been very welcoming of our engagement. I interact with my Australian and New Zealand colleagues now every day about the Pacific. Uh, we are working to coordinate our efforts across the board, and I think this is a healthy, positive development. I cannot say enough about the Albanese government and Penny Wong. She's been an extraordinarily effective diplomat across the region, and in many circumstances, we're seeking to back them up and support them. But what we're also trying to do, and this is something if I could just encourage people to watch this space, when we roll out the Partners of the Blue Pacific on Thursday, it will not just be what I would call the usual suspects of countries who have longstanding interests in the Pacific, but you're going to see some new countries that are rising to the challenge of doing more in the Pacific diplomatically in terms of business prospects and aid and assistance. And so that's our task. It is not only to step up individually, but in concert with others. And if we're able to do that, I think we will be more effective in indeed you know, matching our uh, potential with the, uh, the goals and aspirations of the people of the Pacific. All right, so we have a lot of hands up in the room and then we have questions online. So I'm just gonna start to pull the audience into this a little bit. I'm gonna start okay. with my Carnegie colleague, actually, Darshan Barua. And please identify yourself so Kurt knows who's asking the question. Thank you. Uh, uh, Mr. Campbell, this is Darshana Barua uh, with the Carnegie Endowment. Um, you, 
Hi, you talked about the presence and the importance of being present in a region and that you're willing to commit and show, show that effort. Um, my question is, in, in, the last couple, in the last two days, we've heard a lot of on the issue of climate change and the accessible to climate finance, but what islands are saying that none of this None of these issues are new, but the attention to that region is new. And, and despite being a Pacific power, it is the first time that Pacific Island leaders are coming to the White House for the first time in 2022. Are you worried somewhere that the messaging is going across that perhaps to island nations, whether in the Indian Ocean or the Pacific, is Washington unintentionally saying that if you want to get our attention first, get Beijing's attention first? Look, I, the only thing I would say on that, and thank you for that, is I, I, I've been focused on the Pacific for a long time. Uh, uh, I, 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 I do not believe that the, the dominant issue here is that simply a competition between the United States and China or between China and other countries in the region. I do believe that the issues that we are confronting are enormous. Uh, they uh, 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 they are recognized as such uh, in uh, the uh, corridors of power in Washington and elsewhere. And I have no problem basically standing up with a straight face and saying, look, this is essential that we meet some of these challenges today to be an effective leader uh, in the Indo-Pacific. And I, I will simply say the framing of the Indo-Pacific speaks for itself. And we can't be in a situation that the latter part of that uh, uh, framing gets uh, uh, not enough resourcing and engagement. And so part of this is simply being true to our intellectual and strategic moorings. Great. All right, let's keep moving. I'm going to go here, please. And please identify yourself. Yeah, thanks. Oh, thank you very much. My name is Ryo Nakamura with Japan's Nikkei Asia. Thank you oh, very yes. much for thank you very much for taking my question. Uh, most of the panelists in this event said the climate change is the number one national security threat for the Pacific Island nations. But uh, the U.S. policy on climate change has changed drastically depending on who has control of the White House, while the Biden administration prioritizes climate issues in its foreign policy. The previous administration withdrew from the Paris Accord. Uh, so my question is, how will you convince Pacific Island nations that the United States is a reliable partner to address climate issues for the next decades to come? Thank you very much. Look, it's a critical point. Um, Evan and I were at another conference earlier this summer with Australian friends. And I would say that beneath the surface of a very polite, you know, sort of a mateship celebration of the United States and Australia, you could sense with many of the Australians the enduring and hard question was, um, what's going to happen to American power? Uh, can we rely on the United States as a steady, stabilizing, determined, engaged presence? Um, and I'm not suggesting that countries are fully satisfied with every element of the Biden administration. Evan would be able to point out to many issues, frankly, that, that countries might have concerns over. But at least they're, most of what they see is relatively familiar and um, understandable. But countries do worry about uh, a, 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 diff, a departure uh, from those longer-term bipartisan traditions. We saw a hint of that during uh, the Trump administration. I think countries do worry about a return to um, a, a period in which the United States reevaluates every element of its international engagement and seeks to put its own interests first and without much consideration for others. And so I can't give you a good answer. Our system does not allow us to make fundamental commitments uh, for the next administration. But I do believe, and Evan can talk to this, that our best policies are those that share bipartisan consensus. And I would say at a general level, at a general level, the Indo-Pacific is one region in which you have um, substantial 
alignment between Republicans and Democrats, not all Republicans and not all Democrats, but you see some alignment. Climate change is an undeniable uh, challenge. Uh, I think there was some hope at some point in the past that this would not be a divisive issue, that it would be viewed in its uh, true existential essence. And we're not sure where this heads into the future as the intensity of storms and other things play out. Remember, a huge part of the Republican base live in rural areas. I think we've seen that in, in many respects, some of the biggest changes are affected in rural areas. You would think that at some point along this path, there will be sort of a kind of recognition accordingly. But I can't tell you that I'm completely comforted by the fact that one party in the United States essentially denies many critical aspects of what I think is obvious with respect to the uh, enormous challenges of climate change. Okay, great, thanks. All right, I have a question on the aisle here. Uh, uh, Prashant Jha from the Hindustan Times. So, uh, two quick questions. One, do you see a role for India in the Pacific and uh, in the uh, you know Blue Pacific Partnership Initiative? Uh, the second question is on President Biden's comments on Taiwan. Uh, Pacific Islands will play a part as tensions escalate there. This is the fourth time he has said it, and this is the fourth time White House has tried to walk back on his comments. Is there a change in policy and what's going to be the approach to Taiwan? So uh, the first thing I would simply say is that India is an observer in the partners of the Blue Pacific. They've been engaging with us. They have strong and deep historical ties in the Pacific. I don't need to tell you that in Fiji and elsewhere. And we look forward to working more closely with India in the Pacific. One of the things that I've been most gratified by is the close coordination uh, with India uh, in the Indo-Pacific uh, on a range of issues, including uh, the island uh, uh, nations. And I look forward to that cooperation continuing. So look, I, I'm not gonna get into a back and forth. I do not believe that it is appropriate to call the remarks that came from the White House today as walking back the president's uh, remarks. The president's remarks speak for themselves. I do think our policy has been consistent uh, and is unchanged and will continue. Our primary goal is the maintenance of peace and stability across the Taiwan Strait to secure and stabilize the status quo, to make sure that there is a healthy uh, uh, dialogue and discussion, try to avoid uh, uh, escalation situations of inadvertence. These continue to be the abiding uh, goals and objectives of the uh, Biden administration, and they are consistent with previous administrations as well. Um, Kurt, I know we've got you for only five more minutes. I have one question here, but I just wanted to check with the team. Are there any questions from the online audience that? Yes. Okay, why don't, uh, why don't you read one of those? And then I'm gonna go to this gentleman here. We'll do both of those, Kurt, and then we'll give you a chance. Yeah, to thank you, Evan. I'm sorry, I'll try to do a little quicker on the answer. No, no, no problem. No, it's terrific. Thanks. We know how much is on your plate. So, Okay, for the first question from the online audience, it comes from uh, Sima Sirohi, who asks, critics say that a critical mass of this administration is preoccupied with the war in Europe and the urgency needed to counter the China challenge is simply not evident. What is your response? Okay, wait, hold that thought. You have one more from online? Uh, one more from online, yes, just, sorry. Kurt can handle that one in his sleep. So I'm just gonna see if, <laughs> gonna cool. see if, there's, I'm gonna see if there's another one. All right, the, the last one right now is, uh, is the US prepared to make real commitments on climate issues, including accessibility to climate finance? They have said that uh, if you are, the climate, the islands have said that if you are not fulfilling these commitments, then you are against us. So where is the US in this? Okay, so one, are we, pre are we over preoccupied from with Europe? at the expense of the Indo-Pacific and then uh, climate finance. And then I'm just gonna ask this gentleman to ask the last question. My name is Ian Marlowe from Bloomberg News. There's a microphone. Oh, sorry. Uh, I was actually going to ask about Taiwan, but Prashant uh, asked that question okay. for me. Um, but I was going to, I was maybe just going to ask about the, the quad and the role of the quad in the South Pacific. Um, it seems like a ripe area, um, but I'm just wondering if there's any more sort of flesh you can add to the yeah. sort of policies Thank going you. forward. Thanks. Okay. 
So, yeah. So, look, I would simply say if you look at some of the major initiatives of the Biden administration, they are indeed in the Indo-Pacific. Um, the ASEAN summit uh, that was held earlier this year, again, unprecedented, huge initiatives around education, technology, COVID, uh, AUKUS, uh, controversial in some quarters, but a clear desire to build an enduring partnership on security between the United States, Australia, uh, and Great Britain, and ultimately to deliver nuclear submarines, nuclear powered submarines to Australia. And the Quad, I think, is a extraordinarily important innovation for the Indo-Pacific. I believe it will become a defining unofficial but critical institution going forward. Uh, president's travel, engagement with leaders, first leader he met was uh, Prime Minister of Japan, uh, uh, new defense resources, and a variety of other initiatives. And we were just talking about another today with respect to the Pacific Island Summit that will be held next week. So I would simply say that, yes, the challenges are enormously important in Ukraine. But the other thing that gets lesser attention is that what I think has been achieved, and again, this is a bipartisan achievement, is that Europeans are more engaged in Pacific and Indo-Pacific um, uh, issues as, uh, than never before, but also Asian countries are more involved in Europe as never before. And so there are, uh, I think, a recognition of greater interplay. We see uh, countries in the Indo-Pacific supporting efforts in Ukraine, whether it be sanctions or providing humanitarian support or even weaponry, uh, close partnership with the United States and other countries in Europe on dealing with the urgent challenges of Ukraine. But I think everyone understands that the longer term challenges are playing out in uh, the Indo-Pacific. And I think what the I think the, the central uh, proposition of the Biden administration is to propel and support a grouping of nations who have an interest in uh, sustaining uh, the operating system of Asia, the Indo-Pacific. And you see close coordination between the countries of Asia uh, and uh, of uh, Europe uh, in that uh, endeavor going forward. And I think that's critical. And I think that will be sustained I've been a part of initiatives that I wouldn't say died on the vine, but didn't get as much uh, push as we'd like. I think no one wants to replicate that and everyone sees the challenges ahead uh, in uh, the Indo-Pacific uh, more directly. On the Quad, um, uh, the Quad is engaged in uh, issues of critical import to all four nations. We spent a lot of time during the first and second summits focusing on the issues of Southeast Asia. At the last in-person quad in Japan, you will note that the four nations committed to new, you know, completely innovative technologies that will allow countries to track um, uh, basically unidentified fish, fishing fleets, which have ravaged the Pacific. They turn off their, their IFF, um, you know, uh, transponder and sail un, uh, uh, unknown uh, into waters to fish. These new satellite capabilities make that impossible, makes it easier for these small, poor island nations to police vast areas uh, uh, of waters that are still rich with fish. And so, yes, the, the, the Quad is committed to this as we go forward. Um, uh, to the Indo-Pacific. I would just conclude by saying that, look, I, I, I think that the United States uh, uh, needs to step up its game uh, 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 across the Indo-Pacific. And we have uh, a, a number of challenges that we've seen historically in the Middle East and more urgently uh, in Europe. But the United States as a great power has the capacity to operate effectively with the understanding that really for the first time in our history, uh, Asia, the Indo-Pacific is going to be the most important enduring 
uh, set of strategic challenges and opportunities confronting the United States going forward. And I think that, again, uh, Evan, is undeniable in a bipartisan context and hopefully something that we can build on as we go forward. Great. Well, Kurt, this is an islands-focused dialogue, so I know I speak for everybody when I tell you how much we appreciate you putting the islands front and center in uh, your priorities and also in the conversation today. And I got a lot on your plate. You got a lot of big responsibilities and you got a lot of leaders coming to New York. So thanks for your time. It's been a privilege and we really appreciate it. I really appreciate it. Thank you all very much. Can I start? Thank you all for participating in the second Indo-Pacific Dialogue over the past two days. I would like to thank all the speakers for taking time out of their busy schedule to share their valuable perspectives. As the SPF program officer in charge of this event, I am pleased to extend my short remarks to you. Stability and prosperity in the Indo-Pacific region is one of the foundations of peace, stability, and prosperity in the world. For the prosperity of the region, it is important that the island nations and their people, the guardians of the oceans, live safely and prosper economically. In this dialogue, Perspectives from Indian Ocean Island countries and Pacific Island countries were shared. Efforts by the United States, Australia, Japan, and others were also introduced. I believe that learning about each country's perspective is a key to solving issues. The situation surrounding the Indo-Pacific region changes daily. And the more we learn about it, the more complex it appears. However, the focus may be narrowed down by a mindset centered on the island nations and the people who live there spread across its vast ocean. I hope that through this dialogue, even if in a small way, we could contribute to tangible efforts for the stability and prosperity of the Indo-Pacific region. Lastly, we would like to, we will do our best to host the Indo-Pacific Islands Dialogue again next year. We appreciate your continued cooperation in this endeavor. If you are interested, please contact us. See you again, thank you. Thank you, Shiro san um, Thank you, everyone. Just last five minutes. So thank you all for coming out and supporting this uh, dialogue. And I do want to take a few minutes. I know this is the last of it, but to thank a few people, especially putting this together in a year, which has been logistically in every way that you can think of that logistical challenge and hurdle has happened. Uh, first to our partners, uh, Sasakawa Peace Foundation, to also Dr. Sanami, uh, who came out here to open kickstart this uh, dialogue, Shiozawa san who's been here. To my, to my colleagues and the Carnegie Endowment, we're based in Washington, DC, it takes a lot to put on an uh, event uh, or a forum in New York. But the idea was to say that the islands matter. And if they are gathering in New York, then we will come to New York to discuss the issues that matter to you. Uh, a, my uh, vice president, Evan Fagenbaum, who gave me two days of his time, despite his busy schedule. Uh, my colleagues back home, Dan Bayer, Ashley Tellis, um, Zaira Abuspan. Uh, but most importantly, the events team here, uh, the group from Carnegie that really put this together, um, Alex Taylor, Catherine Buchanan, and I don't know where you are, but this event would not be possible even for a second if these two uh, people wouldn't have been here. So thank you so much. And I just wanted to, I wanted to applause them because they'll watch it later. Uh, 
Uh, Cliff Jayapranada, Catherine Hoffman, Nitya Lab, communications team back home who's supporting this, making sure that our online team can reach it and watch it and continue to watch it. Clarissa Guerrero, Megan Wigner, uh, Jessica Katz, Kathleen Vogue, uh, Caitlin Vogue, and uh, Doug uh, Farrer. Uh, finally, I just want to say that as we are heading into the White House Summit with the Pacific Island uh, uh, conference of the leaders, there's going to be a lot that's going to be written, there's going to be a lot that's going to be discussed. Um, I hope that you will reflect on these comments and perspectives and the discussions that you heard that you heard in the day and a half uh, yesterday and today, because whether we like it or not, whether we accept it or not, whether we agree with it or not, these are the island voices and this is what what really matters. So I, I hope that as we move forward into that summit and get caught up in a lot of the narrative coming out, we will continue to put island voices front and center when we discuss about island nations. Thank you once again and see you next year.